My first musical memories are sitting on the stairs going up to the second floor of our home. We lived in one of those uh, homes that had the marble steps, you know, row houses, like many people did in those days. And uh, my father would come home late from work, it was around 9 o'clock, and he would relax listening to music. And I would creep down from the bedroom and I would sit on the stairs listening with him. And uh, in retrospect, I believe that he knew I was there. But uh, he never said anything, and so we listened to a lot of music together. The first opera impressions were probably uh, when I was a student at Juilliard, and the Met was on, in, on 39th Street, the old Met. And uh, there were uh, what they called score seats that would be, there were tables way at the top of the house uh, with uh, uh, a chair, and uh, you literally were looking vertically down on the opera. And I remember seeing that, that at that time the the, uh, the Wozzeck that they did and a few Wagner and Verdi operas. So I saw a number of operas there. And I went uh, kind of dutifully because I thought this was a part of the music world that I should get to know, though I didn't really know it very well. And at the time I, it never occurred to me that I would be writing operas. I left Baltimore when I was 15 and went to stay at the University of Chicago. No, I was a, 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 it was part of a program that uh, Hutchins had started at Chicago. It was a great books course. And um, uh, people came from all over to do that. And, and, and uh, age was not a barrier, nor was uh, a high school diploma required. All you had to do was pass the entrance exam, which was surprisingly simple. I think that they were looking for people, and they just... <laughs> They like you, you passed, but I don't know how they did it exactly. But uh, uh, it was basically uh, a great books liberal arts course that I completed by the time I was 19. And at that point, I went to New York. And now, during that time, I was writing music, and I was studying music kind of on my own uh, with books from the library and uh, uh, studying scores. And there were very few recordings of the modern music at that time. We're talking about 1952. So there weren't a lot of, there was, a, there was a, a, a company called Dial Records, do you remember them? And you could hear, you could get maybe the Webern Opus 21 there or something like that. You could, you get a handful of pieces. Uh, but a lot of the, the, a lot of pieces weren't recorded at that point. Uh, uh, I w can you imagine a 15 year old boy trying to figure out what Charles Ives sounded like from a score? And I wasn't playing the piano that well then. I was, my piano was my second instrument and I developed it later. But at that time, playing the piano was not so easy. Well, I was listening to Brahms and, 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 and Mozart also, and Mahler. I was also listening to Mahler and Bruckner. I, I, uh, I had the great good fortune of a very, very broad uh, uh, listening background. My father had a small record shop in Baltimore. This was before the days of the mega stores. And, uh, uh, a record store could be quite a small thing. With a, it's like a candy store, really. It got bigger a little bit, but uh, uh, I, my brother and I worked at that store from the age of 12, and by 15, my memory is that I was doing the, I was the classical record buyer for the store, but that wasn't all I did. We also, the one of the ways that uh, we were kept busy, because I think that was part of the idea, was we were constantly doing inventories of the records, constantly. And you never ended. You finished all the RCA, and then you finished the and then the Dudeca, and then you, had, you started to do the, all the odd labels, and then you started over again, because by that time it was three or four months, and the inventory was different. But I also knew popular music. We had to know that. I, mean, we, I remember in the early 50s, uh, uh, when the first Elvis Presley records came out, and we, uh, it was RCA, and we had boxes of records behind the counter, and we never even, they never even got on the shelf. You just took them right out of the box and sold them. It was the first big, uh, big hits, big, big hits in popular music was, was Elvis Presley. And after that, the Beatles and, of course, everything got going. But, uh, of course, I was very interested in records that sold that briskly. And I knew, all, I knew a lot about music, uh, music too. Well, they were horrible. My first, my first compositions were kind of horrible. But... I didn't know much about composition, but I had read something about Schoenberg, and I began with 12-tone music, because it was, it was a system that I could understand. Uh, I could, didn't understand it musically, but I understood it 
if in a structural way. So I began uh, imitating the, the Weber and uh, Schoenberg and uh, Berg pieces that I knew, which was the Lyric Suite and the, uh, the Schoenberg Quartets, or the, uh, even the Verklechte Nacht, which is an earlier work. And, but I knew that, and, and then the Berg operas, which that's why I was listening to Berg when I was at, at, at Juilliard. Uh, but my first, uh, and those first pieces were written when I was 15, and I barely could get through them, but uh, I, was, uh, I was preemptorily saved from this, what would have been an endless, uh, unassisted <laughs> labor uh, by, uh, by discovering by accident uh, the music of William Schumann and Aaron Copeland. And I said, well, that music made more sense to me intuitively. And I, uh, I discovered that William Schumann taught in New York City, or I thought he taught, actually he didn't. He was the head of the Juilliard School and then head of Lincoln Center. And I did finally meet him the day I graduated. I mean, but, and he was around, and his music was around, too. And so I got to know that. But uh, I, did, I never uh, really met him in the way that I, I went to New York to study the kind of music which I thought that, in a way, uh, uh, it became an alternative kind of modern music. But uh, um, that also had its, uh, it also had its limitations. And, uh, it was really some years later, that not that many years later, that I got involved with uh, a different strategy for writing music that had to do with uh, global music and world music and bringing together elements of, uh, of music history that were, that were born from countries that I had never even visited. It never occurred to me to write an opera. Uh, Bob and Wilson and I were talking about writing a music theater piece in 1974-75. Uh, now, by that time, I had already spent quite a lot of time with a theater company, uh, almost uh, eight or nine years, called Mabu Mind. So I had been writing music for a theater company that was a parallel endeavor that went with the music I was writing for my ensemble. Uh, they really had nothing to do with each other in a certain way. But I spent a lot of time in the theater, and I learned a lot about the theater. It was through that experience that I came to know Bob Wilson and many other people, Richard Foreman and uh, the Living Theater, and, uh, uh, and, and through them, Kotowski and Peter Brook, and the whole... Well, there's well, not that many. Uh, the only uh, uh, the contemporary people that would, I would... Uh, Meredith Monk and Richard Foreman and, and Bob Wilson were the ones that... I, and Living Theater. Living Theater was not always in New York. They were sometimes in... When I first met them, they were in, uh, they were in, uh, in Marseille doing... Uh, um, uh, they were doing a piece called Frankenstein, I believe. Is that possible? That was the name. It was a, it was a, a piece which indirectly uh, got me thinking about opera because they did it in big houses. When Bob and I began working in 74, my background was really in these kind of studio productions of uh, avant-garde work. And basically it was... Uh, work that we made ourselves as authors, or it was, um, um, uh, it would have been um, Samuel Beckett, Jean Genet, and Brecht, the three great uh, European playwrights of that time, virtually unknown in America at that point. Brecht for translation pro problems, uh, his work didn't cross, and Genet for almost the same reason. We didn't know very much about Genet in the 50s. And uh, Beckett was known because it was in English, and, uh, but it wasn't admired uh, widely at, at that time uh, in the early 60s. When we were living in Paris, that was when I say we, I was living in Paris uh, studying with Nadie Boulanger was the, during those years. And that's when I began working with a theater company, eventually called the Mabu Mines. That would have been uh, Joanne Akalatis, who was later at the public theater, uh, 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 Lee and Ruth Brewer, uh, David Warlow, uh, uh, Fred Newman, that was the basic company. It was a very small company. But we were doing Beckett plays. And Beckett lived in the neighborhood. That was the 14th in Paris. And uh, uh, one of us became appointed to be the uh, contact with him, and that was uh, uh, David Warlow, who was virtually bilingual. He was working as an Englishman, working uh, for a magazine in Paris. And was very interested in theater and became, eventually became a professional actor. Uh, but it was through him that we were working with Beckett. And I did, oh, eight or ten scores to Beckett work. Some of them knew uh, with uh, his full cooperation, though his estate denies that that ever happened, but it doesn't matter. And other grand rights. 
conversation. Yeah, we, we did it anyway. And, uh, and he was there uh, uh, helping, and I have notes from him and all those kinds of things. So uh, I had a lot of background in theater. And when I came to New York, uh, um, uh, I started playing on someone. We were working, we were working with uh, Ellen Stewart with the Mabu Mines, and then eventually at the Public Theater when Joe Papp was there. And, and I stayed with that until Joe Papp died, and then Joanne took over. And as a matter of fact, I did a work for the Public Theater last summer with Joanne, the, the Bacchae. So that's been a... Con a continuous uh, relationship is still going on. Now, getting to the question, when Bob and I began working, uh, well, I saw Bob's work, I think it was a, uh, a Life and Times of, uh, I think it was Joseph Stalin, it might have, uh, I think that, that was that one. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, I went to see it at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. This was, would have been in the early 72 or 73. This is before the Next Wave Festival for sure. But Harvey Lixazine had this big, beautiful theater there, and he put Bob, and I, I don't know what he, no one, uh, Bob was a big surprise. I mean, in 73, 70, no one knew what sort. And uh, it, the pieces went on, they started at 6 or 8 o'clock at night, and they went on until dawn. That's how it was. And this, of course, that interested me very much, and I went to a performance of that, and then I saw the letter to Queen Victoria, which was kind of on and off Broadway. It was on a, at a Broadway theater, and ran for two or three weeks there. And Bob and I began a conversation about doing a work together. He had a very good composer, Michael Galassa, who we worked with, a violinist and composer. A very talented guy. Uh, um, but he liked, uh, like many people in the theater, he liked variety, he wanted to hear other musicians. And I had, uh, and I, I, I and, uh, in the same way, I had only worked with one theater. I was ready to work with other people. And so we were at a kind of intersection in our own lives, and we met. And we began talking about a work. It never occurred to us that it was an opera, to be truthful. We were doing a piece called Einstein on the Beach on Wall Street. That was the actual title. The On Wall Street, we eventually said it's in that. It was a little bit long. But uh, uh, the thing about Einstein that we discovered, and Bob wanted it, he had just, he had done these big pieces of Brooklyn. He had done a big piece on Broadway, Queen Victoria. Bob wanted to work, work in a large proscenium stage. Uh, he needed fly space and wing space, and uh, uh, almost always these considerers will have an orchestra pit. Uh, he needed lighting equipment. Uh, you can call Einstein anything you want to, but the only place you could really do it was in an opera house. In fact, since then, when, I've, uh, when I have to decide which of my pieces are operas and which are, say, music theater pieces, for me, the operas that are, the works that are done in opera houses are operas. That was a very easy solution to that question. Because there are kind of, there are some indeterminate pieces, like uh, uh, Bob and I uh, did a piece called Monsters of Grace, which is a 3D video piece, but it's not really an opera. It's done, not done in an opera house. Whereas uh, even a small piece like uh, Les Enfants Terribles, which doesn't take a lot of people, it only takes four singers in a small orchestra, but it's done in opera houses. So uh, it never occurred to us that we had written an opera until we discovered that that was the only place we could do them. Uh, Nina Karlweiss, a wonderful woman, uh, who was, had been a producer and agent for, uh, uh, for Katowski and, and, and Peter Brook, uh, had, uh, she had heard about what we were doing and came to see us in New York. We were working at the Video Exchange Theater in Westbeth. I can't believe I remember all this stuff. I mean, I don't even have any notes that I remember. It. But anyway, this is, we, we were doing this at the Video Exchange Theater at Westbeth, which was a kind of a, it began as kind of an artist co-op building. But at that time, there was a large place, and we did, we did our, our final rehearsals, and I think she was there. At which point, she became our agent and uh, not exactly producer, but she functioned in many ways as the person that, that helped to bring the work out of the rehearsal room and onto the stage. Michel Guy was the head of the theater at Avignon. He had a theater festival there, and he invited us to come there. So that was the first place. And I think that it was uh, Nino Kalbais that brought us there. From there, she began to book it around, and she took it to... Now, that, that's jumping ahead of the story, because in order to do the piece, we needed a chorus, we needed a, a, an ensemble of musicians, and we needed actors, and we needed dancers. Uh, we needed a rather large company, which we couldn't really manage. What we did uh, is that we auditioned uh, people that were singers and dancers, of which there are quite a few in New York because of the, 
the Broadway tradition, people studied how they studied sing, song and dance. That's what they did. And we auditioned a bunch of people. We found our dancers there, and we found most of our singers there. So we were able to combine the the singing company and the dancing company almost into one company. We had a few actors, besides Lucinda Charles, of course. Uh, she, uh, we had a few uh, other people, but and, and Mr. Johnson, who played it. We had a few other people, uh, uh, but uh, uh, and they were important people. Everybody was important. There were so few of us that it had to be important. But we probably did that production with less than 25 people. And when we redid it in 84, we needed 50. <laughs> that happened. We were completely surprised, Bob and I. We were in Europe doing it there. and It was, uh, it was sold out every night, no matter where we went. The two people who came to Paris to see the work were Jane Herman and uh, Gilbert Hemsley. Gilbert Hemsley was actually a, a lighting designer, and Jane Herman was a, a producer there. They were on the staff there, and it was their job to find works uh, to, uh, to be presented on the Sunday nights. And they were the ones that came to Paris. And afterwards, Bob and I, I remember going to their hotel rooms and having a drink with them. And they, and, and they said they were from the Met and they were looking for this piece. Bob and I thought it was completely, we never thought it would happen. In fact, they were the ones that did it. And we were, we were guests there, we were invited. Uh, Jerry, Jerry Robbins got them to come. Jerry Robbins was an old friend of Bob's and I had known him a little bit. Didn't know him very well, but he was an admirer of Bob's and he, uh, um, he and he he thought this would be something that would work there. Uh, it was sometimes reported that we had rented the Met. If only we could have rented the Met, we didn't have any money to rent the Met. Basically, we were co-presented uh, by them, and they. Uh, what Bob and I didn't realize was that operas operas lost money. We didn't know that until the whole thing was over, uh, and uh, uh, when the whole thing was over, we discovered we had. They had a huge debt, and we're talking about 1976, and we're talking about $90,000. It was enormous debt, and we had no idea how that had happened. Of course, Bob and I weren't paying attention at all. We thought we had full houses. It never occurred to us, but uh, Nina Carlweis, she knew. And uh, we, we, when she had, we had a meeting with her, it was hilarious. She had a wonderful woman. Her, her husband had been a Hungarian actor. She was Hungarian herself, and he was a famous actor. In fact, I remember there was an oil painting of him on the wall. And she said she wanted to have a very serious talk with us, and he wanted us to know that it had been a great success, but that we had a debt, and that was the debt. And Bob and I almost fainted. I said, my God. He said, Nina, how could you let that happen? He said, look, the only way to sell the piece was to sell it uh, at a loss. We lost money every night, and we did. We lost three or 4000 a night, and we did 35 performances. And she said, she said, but... It had to be seen. She said. She said. She said. She said. I know this is a devastating news, but the fact is, is that this eventually will make your careers, and I had to do it. Well, she was right. I'm sure she was right. Uh, that was a big surprise. Uh, Bob, uh, uh, he got busy training. He got busy working in Europe, and we both were concerned with the debt. But uh, he, he, I think, became. We worried about it for years, and he took it on as a personal responsibility. I, I did what I could. I sold some score, and I did some concerts, and Bob was, uh, I think he, in a way, this pattern of losing money and making art is something Bob, I don't say that he enjoyed it, but he embraced it with an enthusiasm which I didn't have. And, and to this day, I mean, he, he's been raising money, putting on projects for years. I mean, Einstein was kind of a training ground for him, and his done extremely well with this. I mean, you would say, well, why don't people like Bob, or why don't they are supported by institutions? But we're not. The work doesn't fit into, into an institutional image of any kind. Uh, uh, I, I was, uh, I never expected, I didn't expect to do any more operas, and I was in, I was uh, Hans de Rowe, who was at the Netherlands uh, Opera House. I was in, uh, in, in Holland a little bit after, and he, maybe a year or two after, and he asked me to come and see him, and he said, he said, well, I saw Einstein, it was a very interesting opera, how would you like to do a real opera? And I said, well, what would that be, Hans? We were, very, we were already quite friendly. He said, well, it should be from my chorus and my orchestra, 
and for singers trained in the tradition of opera singing. And he said, and I, I agreed, I said, I'd like to do that. And, and he said, think it over. And I thought it over, and I saw him about a month or two later, and I said, how would you like to do an opera about Gandhi? And he said, that was fine. And then I hesitated, and I said, now you remember the Dutch were in South Africa? He said, oh, that wasn't us. <laughs> and I've never had any problem with Holland with the, with the Dutch and South African connection. It, that connection was never made by anybody. But uh, uh, General Smuts was a, uh, he was a Dutchman. The adversary of the opera was a Dutchman. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I, I wasn't doing it for that reason. It was, uh, uh, I, in fact, it had come up this way. When Bob and I were looking for a subject of the work we were doing, we spent about eight, six, eight months talking. We had lunch every day at a certain restaurant on Sullivan Street, and every Thursday, rather, every Thursday, we were both in town, we had lunch there. It wasn't every Thursday. It was maybe a couple of Thursdays a month. So maybe we had six or eight meetings of that kind in the course of, uh, of six or eight months. Uh, and uh, we were talking about it, and it, we were going over a subject, and I was reading about Gandhi because I had been traveling in Europe and India, and I suggested Gandhi, and Bob just didn't, it's not that he didn't, it didn't catch his imagination. He suggested, he, Bob liked, a, uh, he didn't mind controversial figures like Stalin, and he, he mentioned, well, what about Hitler? And I said, no, he didn't want to do that. And then I said, what about Gandhi? And he said, no, he didn't want to do that. And he said, what about Einstein? And I said, yes, I can do Einstein. Because Einstein was a, a hero of mine from a very early age. Don't forget, uh, in 1945, I was already eight years old when uh, he became almost, a, uh, with the Nagasaki, uh, with the, the bombings in Hiroshima, uh, the atomic bomb, the, he became the, uh, probably the best known scientist who ever walked on the planet, and he was alive. And there were photographs of him, and he gave lectures, and he wrote books. And as a boy, I would uh, go to, public, uh, to the public libraries in Baltimore and hear talks about uh, relativity and uh, splitting the atom and all this stuff, so I was very interested. And science became a hobby of mine. And still is to this day. In fact, I've done four or five operas about scientists just because of that connection. Uh, besides uh, Einstein, there was a Kepler and there was a, a Galileo, and I, I worked uh, on a film uh, um, with, about Stephen Hawking. So uh, I've been wrestling with the idea of Newton, but he's a difficult character. Uh, basically, he, he was such a recluse, no one knew very much about him. Darwin would be a great character, but uh, uh, there have been a lot of Darwin operas, including one by a good friend of mine, John Gibson, The Voyage of the Beagle. And I thought, well, I better stay away from that one. <laughs> it's been done enough. And, uh, but his on that level, of that's the kind of person I was interested in. Uh, so uh, when he said Einstein, I was, I was there. So that became the subject. But then we built this piece, and we needed this material, and we, we met Ninon, and she said we should... And, and, Michel Guy, and before we knew it, we were in opera houses, and we were uh, at the Fenici, in, uh, the, before it burned down some years ago, the old Fenici in, in Venice, and we were uh, uh, at the Opera Comique in, in Paris, and we were uh, at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, well, which was a surprise, because uh, 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 we were invited to come, but Bob and I never actually believed it was happening. And we came, when we came, uh, we were met at the airplane by uh, Paul Walters, a friend of both Bob and mine. And the first thing he said to us when we got off the plane, it was in the first of, beginning of November, he said, you're sold out at the Met. And we, <laughs> we almost fainted. We had no idea. And they, they immediately booked a second night the next Sunday. Of course, we later found out we were losing money every night, and that was the end of it. We could have gone on. We could have had a run at the Met. Uh, we could have gone on for... I don't know, at least a number of other, three or four other performances, for sure. But at that point, when Bob and I realized we were losing, it wasn't anybody's fault. It's just the structure of opera. It's very labor-intensive. You have very skilled, talented people working in a house, and they never, practically never leave it. I mean, it's, uh, the costs are high, the work is intense, and uh, the box office can't do it. So that's why... You have fundraising for opera houses, and that's what the, 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 old, the whole drama of, of being on the board of an opera house is where do you find the money? I mean, this is, so Bob and I were completely innocent of this. 
Uh, they're not really. You have to redefine what it what what a narrative is. You have to redefine what drama is, and that's what. Uh, but we weren't doing it alone. Uh, don't, uh, the world we came out of, the world of uh, the Living Theater and uh, 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 Peter Brook and Grotowski, they had been working for decades with non-narrative and 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 and, and opera based on on fragments, on songs, on words, on images. Uh, the the the. The uh, all what Bob and I did, which was so w was surprising to some people, we took an aesthetic that had grown up in experimental theater and put it in an opera house. That's really what it was. That ex that aesthetic existed. Bob and I were young enough and uh, brazen enough in our ambitions to put it in an opera house. But I don't even know that we did it. Whether it was people like Michelle Guy and then and Carl Weiss and uh, and uh, and the other uh, kind of. Uh, the visionaries in Europe, who were more used to that, you have to remember, opera in America, uh, uh, what, uh, opera in America is, it's not a homegrown, it is, it's not like movies that we invented, or musicals that we invented, I mean, we Americans invented. We invented that stuff. Operas were invented someplace else. Uh, and, and it was in those someplace else's places that we, that we had our great successes. Uh, uh, it took much longer for operas, my operas, to arrive in America. Uh, the Gandhi opera that I did in 1981, I think it was finally done in 86. Uh, and there was a very short tour, uh, but there was one in Seattle and in Chicago and San Francisco. Uh, and that work was seen there. Uh, but uh, no other operas of mine were done uh, in America outside of... Uh, 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 the Brooklyn Academy of Music became, in effect, the home for my operas here for many, many years, and still is. Uh, we just did a, a um, uh, uh, the Kepler opera, which I did last year. We didn't have the money to bring all the sets and costumes, but we brought all the musicians, and we did a, we call it an oratorio or a cantata version of it, but uh, uh, that was done at Brooklyn Academy of Music. Uh, uh, and they have always, uh, uh, first, uh, you know, uh, with, uh, now we have Joe Melillo, uh, um, but, but you know, but, 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 from, but from the beginning, uh, it's been it, it, that has been our home, uh, and then gradually, little by little, smaller companies began doing, uh, like uh, uh, ACT in uh, in Seattle or the company and uh, that Joanne Acklas worked with in, in Chicago, and ART in Boston. Those are theater companies uh, who, uh, 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 there were theater companies that were interested in, in uh, to doing operas, and, and uh, Brustein uh, uh, commissioned uh, um, uh, Orfe, and uh, um, uh, he did, he did uh, the Juniper Tree, he did a number of things. He did uh, some pieces I did with David Henry Wong called uh, uh, The Sound of a Voice. So I found, began finding theater companies that did that, but not opera companies. Uh, it took a long time for opera companies to get on get on board, uh, and they're only gradually. I mean, it's just stopping now. It's, and it, uh, what I've discovered is it takes my personal experiences, and is that you have a you have a even a successful premiere, and you wait about eight or ten years. It takes that long for an opera house to get over the fact that they didn't have the premiere then a restaging becomes possible. It takes about that long. And then uh, my catalog, is a, uh, it runs about 10 years behind the time I write them. But that's, that's better than being dead. I mean, <laughs> and, and having them done. It was through my, and, and Einstein was the first of them. As a, young, as a young boy, I was very interested in science, and that's what I was studying. If I, I began studying mathematics in, 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 uh, at the University of Chicago. I wasn't particularly good at it. I was much better at, uh, at music, as it turns out. And uh, I, I, be, I, I found out right away that there were people very quick in these classes, and I wasn't that quick. And if you're not quick at that stage, it's not going to work. But, but what I discovered was that the, uh, uh, I discovered the poetry of science, that the, the act of imagination, the act of visualizing uh, the, uh, nature in terms of, of numbers and, 
uh, systems of that kind. The, the, the ensemble was vital to the production of Einstein. There would not have been, the ensemble by that point had been together almost eight years. We had a very solid base, and uh, Michael Reisman was becoming the music director during that period, uh, which uh, I handed over a lot of those duties to him, which were, he was an invaluable assistant. Uh, we had a, with Kurtman Casey, we had a sound producer and sound, uh, a sound producer and sound designer. Uh, that was all from my original group. Uh, that became, that meant when, when Bob and I went into the building of Einstein, I had all the technical uh, help on my side that was part of my, uh, part of my outfit. Uh, I didn't have to go out and find people. We, we had been working with this kind of technology for, for almost a decade. So it was very, very important. However, uh, I made two decisions. I don't know how conscious they were, but after the great success of Einstein, I did two things. I wanted to do an uh, I, I wanted to do an opera in a, a real opera house like uh, with, with exactly what Hans de Rohe said, with his singers and his orchestra. You have to remember, at Juilliard, I'd had the training to do that anyway. I had sung in the chorus for two years, which everyone had to do, if you were, unless you were already a singer, but if you were, or, or if you were playing in the orchestra, you didn't have to do it, but if you were a composer or a conductor, or, or any, uh, 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 you were pressed to, to service in the chorus. So I'd been singing in the chorus for several years. I knew a lot about that writing. I knew about vocal writing from, from being with singers. And what I didn't know, I, I found very early on, I remember talking with Claudia Cummings, who was the first soprano with, uh, uh, and, and I said to her, I said, now Claudia, tell me how is the part for your voice. Now, the fact is, if you ask any singer about their part, they will definitely tell you. And they'll say, well, you should do this, and this is better for me. And, and, I, began to, and I began to discover that the best people to talk about singing are singers. They will tell you what's going on. And I, and, uh, I always, uh, when I'm working with uh, opera, I, always, I try to, to uh, do the auditions first. I like, I like to know who the singers are. And I work with them as closely as I can because uh, I know a lot about how the, some singers uh, like to use the whole range of their voice and some say stay away from this and I don't have that note and all kinds of things that you have to know about. Now, that doesn't mean you, can't, you can make the changes in rehearsals, but it helps when you can do it that way. It's always a question to the singer. When you have a, 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 a is it Richard Croft uh, who sings? Richard Croft, you know, he has a brother named David Croft, so I have to get them. So, and, and he was singing, uh, let's see, he was singing another opera of mine when all this was going on. So I had the, I had the two Croft brothers in two operas at the same time. But uh, uh, I think he was... Uh, I think he was singing Galileo. No, I don't remember what he was singing, but but it was it was Richard who was singing. That. Richard, uh, with a what what a good singer. What any instrument, what any performer, whether they're a singer or a player, what they do uh, to your music is they they complete it. Basically, I'm just writing down notes on paper. To put something on the stage or to put it on any kind of stage at all, uh, the the power, the interpretive powers of the singer of the performer, are. What will make and will will, will 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 make a work succeed? Without that, uh, you have very little chance. You'll just have to wait till that that person comes along. Uh, the completion of the work really comes with the performer. There's no doubt in my mind. And I've worked as a performer myself for 30 years, 40 years, and I understand exactly how that process works. Uh, uh, so that uh, uh, when you have like a uh, with Croft, you had a a beautiful interpreter. I had that with with. Uh, with uh, 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 with Perry, uh, uh, Douglas Perry. Douglas, I had that with Douglas Perry. He was a wonderful, that's uh, wonderful, uh, Gandhi. And then I had it a second time, but almost uh, I mean, tw almost twenty years later, uh, with another singer. Uh, uh, they can bring something to the work which you, uh, which you can dream about, but you can you can hardly visualize it. I began, uh, I began operas thinking about uh, the social content. I don't like the word political because political is a shorter, uh, the short way of looking at things. It's social issues that are important. Well, political issues aren't that important. The social issues are the paramount issues, and that's what Gandhi was involved with. And I did that for quite a while. The, the first three operas really are about that, and it's continued uh, uh, a little bit later when, it, when I got into the in the 90s, I began working with operas like Les Enfants Terribles and Le Belle Le Bet, 
And then I began thinking about uh, the personal issues. Uh, I got into that dimension of, 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 let's say, of the moral tone of an opera. But, uh, uh, for example, uh, a La Belle La Bette, uh, uh, with Cocteau. Cocteau uh, was always dealing with big issues, but he did it in the form of a, of a person like La Fay. Or 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 Paul in in Les uh, or 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 La Bette in La Bette. Uh, 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 he had that ability to use the, uh, the individual kind of as a, as a prism for his, all the issues to fall, flow into. That I've, that's why I've been such a great admirer of Cocteau. I feel he has been uh, uh, never, uh, I think, accorded the uh, admiration and respect that he deserved. Uh, uh, when you look at the, uh, what I did, I took three of his uh, films, Les Monteries, Le Belle Le Belle Norfe. I took the, uh, the, the screenplays and I used them as librettos. And uh, by that time I had been working with librettos and when I started working with Cocteau, I said, oh my God, this guy, he knew exactly when to bring a character in, when to develop the character. He knew, he understood it. He un I, I would say the, the one, there is one better than him and that's Shakespeare. Shakespeare was was a great, but not because we love Shakespeare, because he was he was a mechanic of the theater. He he was a technician that knew exactly how to bring a character, how to keep the attention, how to do all of that stuff. But Cocteau could do it too. But somehow, because he was also a painter and a writer and a bit of a, a dandy and a bit of a, a, but he wasn't at all a dilettante as he was sometimes accused of. He was a he was a thorough uh, uh, craftsman in, in all the arts that he worked in. If you look at the paintings, if you look at the plays, if you look at the films, he he had a total technical grip and artistic vision. But with him, he led me into the uh, in the arena of the personal, and and uh, and I've I've been very comfortable in that place since then. The funny thing is, is that by the time we got to Einstein on the Beast, that was seventy six. There were huge audiences, and they were always big. Uh, they weren't always consistent. Uh, uh, in the last years, the big audiences have become more consistent. Uh, but uh, what I discovered, and Bob discovered also, was that there was a much bigger appetite for experimental work than anyone had imagined. We were getting bigger audiences than um, uh, than Grotowski. I mean, we people that we had we had grown up admiring, but we. Uh, they were they were enviable audiences, and and um, that was always true for Einstein, and, and true for many of the other works. Uh, uh, they were not always a, what you would call a typical opera audience. Uh, they would come from different. They would come from the world of dance, the world of visual arts, uh, poetry, uh, related. Uh, you know re re these different modalities of art. Uh, they they. Uh, Part of our audiences were that uh, were large because they were a composite of a lot of different things. If you liked movement, or if you liked image, if you liked music, if you liked text, they were all in these operas, and they were served in a, and 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 they were all done in a, served in a in, in a progressive way. I could say uh, uh, that hasn't always. I mean, there are times when we uh, when there have been various recessions that we've gone through the, as a country and in the world. And when our when everyone else has went down, ours went down too. When when the Broadway shows were playing at seventy percent, we were playing at seventy percent too. When the commissions uh, for a new when the money for films was going down, ours went down too. We we we're in the same economic boat as everyone else from that point of view. Uh, the most interesting thing about the audience is that it has stayed very young. Uh, it's more normal for the audiences to age with the audience. So if you go to see the Rolling Stones, you'll see people in their 50s there. You're not going to see kids of 18 there. Not really. If you go to see uh, Leonard Cohn, I, I, now you'll get some younger people. Uh, but uh, what's happened is that um, every generation has, there have been new audiences for this music. And one of the reasons we've restaged some of the earlier pieces is because we thought it was important for a younger audience to see the work because they were still there. So the idea of a uh, uh, you have a kind of an evergreen effect with this kind of work, and I, I don't really know why that's true, but I can I can attest that it is true. Well, we've seen it. Uh, it's not uncommon for people uh, to bring their children, uh, 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 people of fifty bringing their children in their twenties, and they saw it the first time, and they wanted to make sure their kids didn't miss it. 
That's, that's quite, that's quite uh, encouraging, isn't it? Oh, very close siblings. Uh, the elements of uh, opera, text, movement, image, music, are the, the same elements in film, identical. Uh, many other things are different. Uh, the, the, the marketplace doesn't play such a decisive role in the opera house as it does in the film world. However, that can be a, we do experience that too. Uh, operas are revived when, with the expectation uh, that they can sell a few tickets here and there. If, if something doesn't sell well at all, it takes, uh, uh, it takes an opera company of courage to do it again. If it sells well, it will come back more easily. In that way, it's related to the marketplace. But uh, uh, the, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, hasn't changed is that the opera house is the composer's house. It always has been. If, if you're the composer, then uh, the director cannot be appointed. He has to, be, he has to go through you. Uh, once you have the director, then the director and you will talk about the designer. And then it goes on like that. But uh, in the film world, <laughs> there's a, the only person lower in the film, uh, in, the, in the hierarchy, is the writer. The writer! <laughs> uh, so this is just the way, this is the, uh, it used to be that the directors were in charge of the movies, and then it became the producers, and now it's, it's the marketing people. This is the truth. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that there, that, that hasn't driven these uh, art forms further apart. Uh, it's not uncommon to find a film composer beginning to work in opera house and the other way around uh, because the, uh, the, you're working with the same kinds of materials. Uh, they're extremely talented people in the film world and uh, it's a pleasure to work with them. To work with them is to work, it's like working with an extremely talented person in the opera house. I've, I've seen uh, some very talented film composers have traveled in the world of, of, of concert music, not because their work uh, uh, was not fit for it, but because uh, there were cultural differences that couldn't... For example, they didn't get enough rehearsal time. I mean, to do a new work, if you do a, a write a symphony, you get three or four hours, maybe. But uh, uh, that's not enough. It never was enough. Uh, and that can be, uh, I've known film composers to spend their own money to get rehearsal time that they couldn't get from the, uh, from, from the uh, symphony, you know, and then they just couldn't do it. So there are things like that that can happen. Uh, uh, and it's difficult for the composer. Uh, and yet, the, the, the other thing, that it, to work in film takes a certain amount of flexibility, but... Uh, uh, much more than you need in an opera house. You can dictate the terms more fully in the opera house. Uh, but if you want to work in the, in the world of film, you have to have, uh, there has to be some collaborative spirit or it's not going to work at all. And even then it may not be enough. But this, let's put it this way, it's not uncommon for film composers to be fired. It's very uncommon for opera composers to be fired. When you talk about a work which is a composite of text, image, movement, and music, those are the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. That's it. Uh, there may be a fifth element. I haven't found one yet. You can do with less. A dance might not have a text, but it might. A play might not have um, a movement. I mean, it could be... Uh, there's a play of Beckett's called uh, Le Comedie. There are three f heads in an urn. There's no movement at all. There's a light that moves. So you can dispense with some of these in the theater or with dance, Oh, the radio, radio plays. All of these things are possible. Uh, the, the 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 king and queen of the of the, the of, of of the entertainment world is the opera and the film. I don't know which is the king and which is the queen. You decide for yourself. But that's what it is. I, I've never considered myself a teacher. Uh, I, I was afraid that I would be a poor teacher, and I think there's nothing worse than having a poor teacher. Uh, I just didn't have the confidence to be a teacher, really. And also, I wanted to be in the thick of the music world, and I, I felt the, the academy was not going to allow me that privilege. Uh, and I'm, in that regard, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm correct. Uh, 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 when people have come to the studio uh, to work, I take two, or th or two, usually two assistants at a time, sometimes one, and uh, they sit here. First of all, they, they know computers much better than I do. 
So I hire them as true assistants. I, I need them. Uh, I still write with pencil and paper. Uh, I, uh, I have to remind people to have paper and pencils in the studio because if they don't, they will disappear. Uh, but uh, I, I demand pencils and erasers at all times. And there's a jar there, and there is music paper around here. But, uh, but uh, uh, most composers, uh, let's say anyone under 30, doesn't write music anymore. It's all done on the computer. I'm sure you know that. In fact, it's gotten to the point where all the copying is done on the computer. Not only that, but if you want to buy music paper, there's only one place in, in U USA to buy music paper. I have to send away for it, and it comes the next day. I can't, there used to be five places in New York I could buy music. I could buy different shades of green or white or sizes. or that. There's, That's gone. Uh, my generation, uh, and the one be, uh, younger than me, perhaps, or several younger than me, will be the last ones to use music paper. But, however, uh, what I, uh, what, uh, uh, so what can they learn from me? Well, I don't, really don't know. I, they, we do a lot of, we do film work here. I prepare music for operas here. Uh, if you're interested in opera or film or plays or orchestras or writing commercials, I do that too. If you want to know how to write a commercial for uh, IBM, uh, I know how to do it. Uh, I've got them out there. Uh, so uh, what I found, and it's very interesting, among the younger composers, and uh, Nico is a very good, he's an extremely gifted young man, but uh, uh, these are, are young men and women who want to work in the music world. And they make no bones about how they, they don't mind making money working partly in commercial work and partly with uh, in the concert hall in the opera house. Uh, there was a time when uh, doing commercial work was considered very bad taste. Yet, uh, quite a few composers, especially the European ones, that during the war they ended up in Hollywood, and, and some of them did quite well, and uh, some of them didn't. And some of them, <laughs> they're hilarious, sto hilarious stories about, oh, you don't have time for them now, about uh, uh, what happened when Sherberg and Stravinsky showed up in Hollywood. Uh, they, they didn't actually end up doing film music, but the, 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 uh, the, 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 the the level of misunderstanding was very, very, it was very, very funny. But anyway, uh, uh, now with the, and I think uh, uh, there, we have two, uh, uh, Tan Dunn and John Corilano, both have won Oscars. And they would not be considered Hollywood composers by any stretch. And uh, I, I, I think that John, I don't know Tan Dunn that well, I think John is very pleased. His one, I think he's had a Pulitzer surprise, and, uh, and, and, um, and an Oscar one. Right? I mean, so it's like, like I've had, by the way, I've had neither, but that's done. Well, we have, the, you know, a different, uh, I found my own way. That's, I guess, that way I can say it. Uh, but I'm, uh, when, when, a, when a composer becomes successful, by that I mean he can make a living uh, uh, both doing art music and commercial music, and my hat's off to them because it's not easy. And not everyone can do it. Not only a handful of people ever did it anyway. I mean, a generation before, um, uh, there, were, there were a handful of composers, German, Paul Dassault, and uh, uh, Three Penny Opera uh, uh, with uh, uh, Brecht and Kurt Weill. I mean, Kurt Weill did that. And then he ended up doing some beautiful film scores. Uh, and he came, but you have to look around, uh, and there's a history of that. In, in, in Central European art music of people who did that. Uh, they, they were not admired by the Academy. Uh, they, I, think that, I think that's over now. No, then you meet me. <laughs> and, and, and Nico and a bunch, whole bunch of people were waiting there with open arms and empty music pages ready to work. Uh, I think what you're getting, I think what you're suggesting, uh, you're suggesting that uh, these uh, self-definitions of opera and theater and commercial and high art, they're crumbling. And, uh, uh, and what we're finding in the younger generation is uh, an ease with which a young person can say, well, I say, what are you, what are you doing to make a living? He say, well, I, I do video game music. And at the same time, uh, they'll say, would you like to see my new symphony? <laughs> you know, and so I think there's an, uh, a, a, a certain lack of self-consciousness about that and the fact that we don't, we don't judge people so much about uh, um, uh, our definitions aren't, uh, don't come, come with judgments of that kind. 
uh, if you're young enough and you're strong, uh, I think a young man and woman, a woman today could. Uh, 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 also, uh, there's some wonderful conductors around who are. I mean, the gender thing in conducting is over, and you just there are wonderful conductors out there. Um, Ann Summers, who does the uh, who did Ofe, very good conductor. Marin also a, a dynamic, interpretive, commands the respect of audiences and, 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 and the orchestra. So the gender gap is over there, and I think uh, it's it's going to be over in the in composition too. This it's, it's been hard. Uh, the theater world has been uh, re, a little less resistant, but even then, um, uh, it's been difficult for very talented women. Uh, in these fields too. It, of course, in choreography, that's always been true. Invariably, the, the best collaborator is a, a person who has arrived at some confidence in themselves. Uh, the more confidence they have in themselves, the more open they are to what their collaborators do. The less sure they are about themselves, the more um, controlling they become about other people's work. Uh, I was working with Woody Allen not too long ago, a year or so ago. Um, I had no idea where they have been. I've been making movies and, and wonderful movies for a long time. It hasn't worked with a lot of composers. Um, he was completely open about what I did. Uh, Scorsese was the same way. And, and, not, and not just older people like them, but some, uh, some of the younger, uh, uh, younger, younger filmmakers have been like that too. Um, uh, I was th thinking, uh, Bernard Rose has been like that too. He's not that young anymore, but but there have been younger people, not so well known. Who the the more confident uh, the the collaborator is about themselves, the easier it is for them to work with other people because th there's plenty of room here. Come on, come and join me. And what they do is, is they want to say, well, what what can you bring? Not. Not I can't like that. I don't want that. And I don't like oboes. And please don't. Pl talk to me about French horns, and they don't even sometimes know what an oboe is. I mean, you get very odd things can happen. But uh, uh, the, the, the best collaborators are people who, uh, uh, who know what they want and, 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 and feel confident about themselves. And then the best collaborations are where, uh, where uh, there are, are very few rules. Uh, when I work with someone, I never tell them what to do. Bob and I, when we worked on Einstein, we never discussed... Uh, Orchestration. He never orchestration with me. I never discussed stage design with him. Uh, I remember once, and all the time we worked together, we were working on something. And I said, and there was a Bob said, "What's that instrument?" I said, "It's a piccolo." He said, "Oh." He didn't say anything else, and I changed it to a flute. And he never said anything else. Then one time I said, "Bob," I said, that was, "One time in all the years I've worked, I said, what's that? What's that piece of scenery doing there?'" He said. Didn't say anything and it disappeared. <laughs> but those are two comments between two people who worked together for a long time. Uh, he never said anything. Uh, he never. We talked about work and we talked about things. We also talked about uh, all kinds of things besides the work itself. Bob always felt with Einstein, for example, that everybody knew who Einstein was, so we didn't need to tell the story. And I thought the same way. At the first rehearsal. Uh, and it's only for strings and, and winds. Um, and uh, the orchestra began playing, and, and hit, hit, they were grumbling and moaning and groaning about this and that. And uh, uh, the, the conductor said, look, he says, if anyone doesn't want to play this work, please leave now. And about half the orchestra got up and left, and suddenly the piece sounded much better. We, hadn't, we didn't have to do that at the Met. The Met Orchestra has been very uh, receptive to the work. And, but, you know, it's a, bit, a few years later. And the chorus is wonderful at the Met. Uh, we didn't have that problem. But the first performances, and we're also with uh, Dennis Russell Davis doing Ignatum for the first time in Stuttgart. It was, the first rehearsals were really tough. And Dave, uh, he was very, very patient, patient with them. Uh, and uh, uh, they finally came around. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, people... Uh, that was uh, that was the rule for a long time. I didn't do orchestra music because it, that kind of thing happened. But I, uh, I began writing symphonies really in the eighties. I didn't write my first symphony until I was in my fifties. So that would have been uh, uh, Dennis commissioned it, 
And by that time, I, I knew so much about the orchestra from writing for opera houses. I, I learned, I studied orchestration in Juilliard, but I mastered orchestration in the opera house. And uh, th by the time I was writing symphonies, I really knew what I was doing. Nadine Boulanger and Ravi Shankar. Uh, and I met them about the same time. In the early 60s in Paris, I was Ravi Shankar's assistant, and I was studying with Nadine Boulanger. And um, I've sometimes said that I, uh, uh, one of them taught with love and the other through fear. So it was like having two angels on my shoulder, one on the right shoulder, one on the left shoulder. And in the end, the, the method mattered not as much as the quality of the teaching. She taught two things that, were, that, were, uh, that were, you couldn't learn anywhere else. She taught you to visualize music, to hear it. She, she trained you so you could start to hear music, actually contrapuntal music, complex kind of music in your head. And she did it through a series of exercises and trainings that, were, that, were, uh, that went on for hours and hours every day, and it went on for years and years. Uh, uh, singing the Bach chorales, er, uh, singing every part and playing any other part, transposing at sight, all this kind of stuff. She, she, was, uh, she was able to do that. The other thing that she did, she did a very amazing thing. I can't go into it in detail now, but she, without question, with her you learn the difference between style and technique. You learn that style is a special case of technique. That, for example, when you hear a measure of Mozart, why do you know it's Mozart? You know it's Mozart because, uh, because the, his style was a special case of the technique of the day. And that would be true of Rachmaninoff, that would be true of me, that would be true of anybody. That, that uh, uh, the reason that we have to acquire a, a solid technique is only with a technique can a style be evolve? It's after the technique has been established that the style evolves. Look at Stravinsky. And she did that. Uh, she, she, she had precise ways of teaching that. And any of her students, if we had time, we could go into it. But that's another conversation. Wow.